With the release of the Prophet and Warlock DLC for Total War Warhammer 2, we've gotten not only the two new Legendary Lords, but a third one in Tic-Tac-Toe. And this has opened up three new campaigns in the Vortex and their equivalent in the Mortal Empires campaign. But what are the finer points of tackling these campaigns, and how can you go about it with relative ease? In my experience, 10 and 1 is the more challenging campaign because it pits you against some difficult AI armies right out of the gate. In this video, we're going to go through a guide of the first 20 crucial turns of the campaign. Now, I've done these guides before, and we've established that the first 20 turns of any campaign are generally pretty similar for everyone. And after that, once you've really established yourself, that's when it becomes custom to the way you want to play and what you want to do. I'd like to open up this video, though, with a huge thank you to Loremaster of Sotek for letting me bounce ideas and strategies off of him. He's probably the best cam player, player that I know, so we brainstormed back and forth for some of these points. So if you haven't, go ahead and head over to his channel. He does a lot of campaign Let's Plays where you can see his um, campaign strategy brain to find work. So well, how we'll structure this video is that we'll go into the finer points or specifics such as research, skill paths for your characters, priority targets for conquest, and overall strategy of how to approach things. And I'll break it down from the beginning, then I'll jump to a save where I'm a little bit further in the game. You can kind of see the juxtaposition or at least how some of these strategies have uh, come to fruition. And here we are, the very first turn of our 10 and 1 campaign. We haven't done anything yet, so before I go into some general strategies and how things work, let's go through um, how some of the finer points of 10 and 1's campaign work. So you've got a bunch of different mechanics here. For one, you've got the Prophecy of Sotek and its many stages. On stage 1, you can see the current effect is an upkeep of plus 200% for any type of Saurus infantry. This includes Temple Guard, as it says right there. This also includes Saurus heroes, Saurus lords, and Cold One riders. Anything that's got a Saurus involved in it, you're going to get a 200% upkeep. So, for those of you guys that are used to playing Lizardman campaigns and relying on a very strong backbone with your Saurus infantry that can really outclass a lot of Tier 1 infantry, especially in the beginning of the game, you're not going to be relying on that here. It's going to be predominantly a skink army. And that's actually quite all right and quite fun, to be totally honest with you. So you can see what the requirements are from this little menu. It's also displayed as a quest on the right side of the screen over here in this uh, this portion. Uh, the requirements for the next one, you'll see um, this is Rise of the Red Crests, Rise of the Red Crests. That is the stage name number one, Rise of the Red Crests. You can see the requirements here are to own two provinces in their entirety and perform five rituals using the uh, rituals of Sotek that we'll take a look at in just a second. Once you do that, you of course get the rewards for them. You get some nice bonus to your treasury at 5,000 and sacrificial offerings. And for the um, the rituals, you get the tier two sacrifices a lot. So I would recommend that you really focus on these missions as much as possible. The prophecy of Sotek, I would argue, is almost more important than the ritual process this itself. Even though this is the Vortex campaign and the ritual alignment is how you win the campaign, uh, getting these, these prophecies kind of progressed gives you so many benefits and they're so huge to your army that I just I cannot stress it enough. So let's take a look over here at the, rich, the sacrifices of Sotek. And you have this new currency called Sacrificial Offerings. You get this from being in combat, and it is a alternative to what would typically be a unit replenishment portion for an army. Um, sometimes it's like you get to eat them if you're the lizard man, or you get to like um, turn them into food if you're Skaven, or you press gang them into your army if you're other factions. Um, for this, rather than doing that, you do get that unit replenishment, but you also get 50 sacrificial offerings every time you select that as an, as an option. So if you attack an army and you win and that army doesn't fully get destroyed and it retreats away, you can then follow up and destroy it and you'll get 100 sacrificial offerings. It's a very, very huge benefit there. Um, we'll go into some finer details on this once we get to it, um, but I just want to talk about this on a very high level real quick. Um, as always, though, you have your uh, geomantic web that is inclusive of any Lizardman campaign. Uh, the way this works here is any one of these big circles, when you have control of those, um, you can increase the strength of your geomantic web. Ours right now is at level two or strength two. We can we know that by left clicking on the settlement and we can see it in the lower left corner here. Now to increase your geomantic strength, you'll need to build it. Ooh, where is it? <laughs> you can only build it in a capital. Ah, oh, there it is. You need to build a geomantic pylon. And as you build geomantic pylons, it increases the strength of your uh, geomantic web. What's the benefit of that? Well, you'll see here that you've got these uh, commandments that you can order. 
And since we're at Geomantic Strength 2, we get access to the, the second little node here. And as you increase your Geomantic Web, that you can see that kind of increasing all the way up to Strength 5, which gives you Winds of Magic and Research Rate of 5%. You, again, you need to create a Geomantic Pylon in both of these circles to get the Strength increase. So if you own Kyx here and you go and make your Geomantic Pylon all the way to the top, it doesn't matter if you haven't matched that Geomantic Pylon on any one of these other cities that has a circle. And these lines point you in directions to cities that will have circles on them. So we can see here that the Citadel of Dusk has one. Um, this city right here will have one where uh, the Blessed Dread starts. Also, Forgotten Isles will have one, and I think the other one might be... It's not the Sentinels over here, but it's like right around here, I believe. So as you get, gain these cities, you want to build those Geomantic Pylons. You want to make that a priority. So that is just a, a general high-level overview of this campaign. But now let's take a look at some general strategies and specifics here. So... First, my biggest note is you want to turtle up hard and fast. Initially, you want to make three units of skinks. That should be your, your go-to right there. It, there's no different than any other campaign. Um, normally, though, that's like the way you approach campaign is very aggressive in that ver for first turn. You build an army, and on turn two, you're going to war. Not so much here. You really want to slow your roll. So you want to prioritize rank two, or this whole building chain in general. You want access to Salamander hunting packs and to Chameleon skinks very quickly. You want access to ancient salamanders they're very very strong but build this out the spawn pool of the braves fast because we want to get researching quickly and that will be your turn one that's really all you need to do um, i would recommend of course going into diplomacy and once you unlock trade routes to these two you'll want to do that as well but we haven't gotten there just yet and i'll talk about how to do that we'll end turn two this clan fester guy is always going to move right above ten and one and he's going to go into an ambush stance and you have to be careful here. Uh, this can go one of two ways, and this is this is the very... I don't typically recommend save scumming, but this is a situation where I would absolutely recommend it in this situation. Um, here, let's go ahead and fast forward on that. We don't want to deal with that. Well, Clan Fester is going to move right above us, and this initial engagement is going to be very important. Ambusher discovered, which is good. If you don't discover him, it could get pretty hairy here. So what we're going to do is, you see this thing, the Bastilodon Arc of Sotek? That thing is going to be your saving grace in the early portions of this campaign. You want to keep that thing alive as long as possible. We're going to go ahead, and of course I don't, I'm just showing you guys a tutorial, so we're going to auto-resolve this. Otherwise, I definitely recommend fighting that. It's very easy to fight fights with 10 and 1 and actually lose a lot of units, but still maintain the actual unit itself. You see, we lost the skin cohort. You don't, you won't always lose a unit when you get in a fight with 10 and one. So you can really get, uh, you can get some really good Pyrrhic victories that again, result in you still maintaining your army because the biggest thing you're gonna see here is look at this, 12% unit replenishment. Boom, we're gonna use, use that. We're gonna move, oh, we get a nice ogre blade. How lovely is that? Move right back into Kex here. Actually, do this. If you, this is another quick tip for you. If you, this is your first campaign, press this little camera button. Uh, this is your faction. I always go fastest. Um, this little hand is allied factions, fastest. I always click these off. Enemy factions off, off, fastest, fastest, fastest. I think fastest. Um, there you go. This should speed up your end turns and your your mid turns will be a lot cleaner because you won't be looking at the camera moving through th through stuff. Um, but you can change that as you want. So you can see our army got pretty beat up by that. That's okay. We're going to recruit more skin cohorts. And we're just going to pretty much turtle here. Now again, we did get a lot of really good uh, sacrificial offerings from that. So bring up Sacrifice of Sotek. And we're going to get the cohort of Sotek Red Crested Skinks immediately. Now, the reason behind this is we don't want to worry about the other one. The uh, Legion of Chakwa is a Sara Spear unit. It says 275, but that is not indicative of the upkeep that you're going to suffer with the 200% penalty. That'll be more like 851 after you get that 200% kind of kick in the dick. Once you do that, Regiment Renown, recruit that as well. Now, the big thing with the cohort of Sotek is you get so much value out of it because of its ability, refuse to die. You can have entities stay in the fight for a lot longer, so even if they're at the very end and they live with just 13 units left in that entity, or I'm sorry, entities left in that unit, 
they're gonna replenish so fast. So you saw, you see how beat up our armory is. We'll take a look at this. In one turn, well, that's not a good one. Here, in one turn, or four turns, these guys are gonna uh, regenerate quite quickly. And we'll have a way to even make that faster. So we're gonna wait a turn here. That's gonna finish the production on our skink building, and we're gonna be able to produce a skink chieftain. I cannot stress that enough as well. Skink chieftains are what is going to help your army steamroll. Like I said before, you can really rely on getting into Pyrrhic victories because you have such a vast amount of replenishment. Okay, research a technology, recruit a hero. So we're going to recruit ourselves a hero here. Um, Brahmach is usually always the best one for some reason. Uh, this, this time not so much, but we'll just do it because we're doing this... Um, this little uh, foil here. And see, he's gonna increase the, the replenishment even further, and boom, down to three turns. So this guy is gonna go quite quickly. I don't think I've illustrated enough how fast this replenishment is going to be, but I'm gonna fill up now with more of our Red Crested Skinks, and I'll go through how, how I think you should construct provinces, how I think you should make your army, but I just wanna show you guys this general strategy in the very beginning, because I think it's very important to see how much pressure you're going to be getting. Um, let's jump into the research portion of this real fast, because we do have that first technology unlocked. So research can be prioritized however you want. My big recommendation is do skinks first, because that's your first one unlocked. This is going to give you ammunition for all your skinks, missile damage for all your skinks, but most importantly, a nice 10% weapon strength increase to all of your skinks. After that, I think you should focus on monuments to get growth, You'll be able to have a construction, uh, I'm sorry, construction cost reduction for province and capital buildings, which you'll be building plenty of, and a reduction cost for all buildings and the time for them as well. So that's a huge benefit. After you get monuments, I think war and crafts are two of your more important ones. You can decide how you want to um, focus on this first. My opinion is go war first so you can get to the sequence of marching campaign movement range. Um, the big thing with campaign movement range is that you want to be able to get ahead of your enemy as fast as possible. Um, the, our, the AI will spend as much time trying to ambush you or double stack attack you with their armies. The campaign movement allows you to get ahead of that as, fa as best as possible and hunt down any kind of nascent, um, not skinks, but skaven that are marauding your lands. So can't recommend that enough. Mar uh, marching is huge. Also, um, Crafts is great because you get additional tradable resources, you get more income from industry, and you get, again, reduction to your uh, cost for resource-producing buildings, which plays into this portion as well. Um, lastly, I do think that the Tablet of Spawning, which you'll get access to pretty quickly as well, um, is very crucial for these two initial portions, but recruitment rank for skinks and their cost reduction isn't too huge because they're not that, not that, it cost, um, not that costy to begin with. I don't, I never, I've never taken this ability, so I think that those one, two, three, four are your big ones. Skinks, followed by monuments, followed by war or crafts, whichever one you want to prioritize first, are your big four you should focus on. Um, because really you're looking at what's the late game for these, and you always want to prioritize upkeep. I'm going to keep saying that throughout the entirety of this, so it's going to be annoying, but upkeep, upkeep, upkeep is going to be so important for late game for you because you're going to be producing so many armies to fight these ritual armies. So you'll want to have as much upkeep reduction as possible. It's going to keep your economy in the green. So with that focused, um, we're already, I think, for turn two. We're going to start seeing a Clan Fester army kind of squeak out from uh, Night Forest here. No, no pun intended with the word squeak there. And another good right you can use is the right of Sotek. Um, we're actually going to perform this right now because I believe we're going to be seeing Clan Fester quickly. Now, the benefit of this right, aside from the awesome ambush success chance, um, is that you get a huge amount of bonuses to your skinks. Weapon strength of 15%, melee attack of 10, their missile damage is going to go through the roof at 20%. Also, you're going to be causing attrition to armies that enter your territory. And that is going to be very common in the later portions of this campaign as you deal with uh, Skaven that are going to hurdle themselves across the mountain using the underway. We'll end this turn here. And this is probably going to be the last turn or so we go of the beginning of the campaign before we jump forward into where um, a more advanced campaign is at so I can talk about some of the, the finer points of where you should progress. Boom! See? Just like I said. Clan Fester comes at you disgustingly fast with a very big army. And really, 
It's a good thing you've been building up skinks this entire time because you're going to be dealing with a disgusting army here. So take a look. So rat ogres are not that big of a deal, but you have two units of plague monks, which are going to do a lot of damage to your units because you don't have a lot of ranged firepower to negate the fact that they've got a low armor. So you do have to focus them down very quickly. Um, also, this army as well. Two more units of rat ogres and two more plague monks. This is just the turn four army. So you can imagine how fucking disgusting these guys are going to get. You're going to see storm vermins. You're going to see play clock catapults. You're going to see a lot of stuff. So you have to keep a lot of pressure on the Skaven. So what we're going to do here is we'll, uh, you'll basically just, you want to recruit more stuff, but you're not going to be able to do it. They're going to attack you in time. You've got your uh, skink chieftain. You want to place him in your army. Remember when I was talking about the replenishment? I hadn't, hadn't realized that the guy wasn't even in the army yet. <laughs> but you can see here how this all kind of stacks up when we look at Tenemon himself. He's got this Chosen of Serpent Gods, so he's going to give 10% physical resistance to all skink units, which is huge. And you're going to be getting the um, casualty replenishment from the ability we used um, with the Embedded Hero as well, and from uh, the Ritual, which gives us a nice 11%, which, uh, which happens on the turn that you do it. Um, okay, so that is... That is what I would say is the early portion of the campaign, the, the first four or five turns that you really have to focus on. Um, once this happens, these guys are going to attack. Um, I don't want to focus on that fight here because I just want to make this a very high level. I don't want to go into the actual battle itself. But what you're going to do is once you win this fight, which you will win, don't worry about it. You've got a, quite a big army here. And on top of that, take a look at your garrison. You've got four nice units of Saurus here. My recommendation is you can rally out and fight them. More than likely, they will just force you into that situation anyway. And it's actually better in the open field because you can use... Oh, where are they? You can use your skink skirmishers to vanguard into the back and do some damage there. But your salamander hunting packs, don't use them behind your army. Use them onto the flanks or rear, and you can do quite a bit of damage to the skinks. You're really going to be relying a lot on the Bastilodon's Arc of Sotek ability here. Um, it will do tons of damage. You just wait till they all kind of coalesce into one big blob march that Bastillon on it in there, and just melt through stuff. Again, make sure that thing stays alive. You need that thing alive for the early portions of the campaign. But really here, that, that's that's the big initial portion of the first four or five turns. Once you've beaten back this army, you have free reign to push into the Night Forest and capture it very quickly. And if you use the Ritual um, Sacrifice after you win this army, or beat this army, your army is going to replenish by the time you reach the edge of your territory. I promise you. So you'll be able to get a lot of early game aggression and push into the dust, ache, dust gate <laughs> real quick. And once you do that, you're on a real good snowball. Once you do that portion, you've gotten a real, really a rid of your immediate threat. You can ally up with the high elves over here, which I would, I would very much recommend. Well, I'm going to do that to exemplify that. Stupid. They'll... They're, they're cool with it. The Blessed Dread, leave them to their devices. The Sentinels of Zeti and the Southern Sentinels will open up as trade partners to you um, once you do a couple other things. So before we switch over to the, the more advanced campaign, what I want to talk about is where to go from here, right? So once you push into the Night Forest, your big first thing after that should be saving up money to make a second lord. Once you make a second lord, because you'll have gained so much money from killing these armies and from sacking the night forest, that you should push that second lord into Zlan Sek and don't have, don't put an army on him. Just push him there, take Zlan Sek, make him um, colonize it. It'll cost you 2,500 gold to do so, but it'll open up trade into the Southern Sentinels, which is huge. And then at that point, you can just turn Zlan Sek into a growth building with the pastures that you'll get as part of its rare um, or its unique building chain. In addition to that, just make it an income building and just kind of drive as much income as you can from this. You're not going to be able to push out the high elves unless you want to focus on going in that direction. But you're not going to be able to do it for 15, 20 turns as you deal with the Skaven. Then this is one of the very few campaigns. Well, not very few, but this is one of the campaigns I would strongly recommend taking your new lord and just pushing him into the ocean here. Have him go and look for... Um, treasures that you can find. Unfortunately, there's none on the map I can highlight. But just have them get those. Those 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 boosts of income are really, really going to help you because you do suffer from a lot of income issues in the early campaign with 10 and 1. So really make sure you're trying to get as many income buildings as you can. And we'll talk about how to build a province in the, in the, uh, in the next portion of the video when we, when we look at the built-out provinces so you can get a better take on things. But 
Your primary objective is going to be to destroy Clan Fester, which is going to be... I'll, I'll use red for this, which will be here. Um, I will use red for this, <laughs> which will be here, here, and their last one is right there. Clan Fester will sometimes move over in this direction, and that will give you a, a kind of a, a natural progression up towards this way. But don't touch Kalita. Leave Kalita to her own devices. She's going to sit here and turtle up at Forgotten Isles and then push out this direction. Do not aggravate her. Don't sign any agreements with her because you're going to have. she's going to be your next target after Fester. So basically, you'll take out Clan Fester. Once you've, you have to be very aggressive with this. You have to constantly be pushing them. But once you um, shut down Clan Fester, try and destroy Kalita. Forgotten Isles are going to be the way that you're going to cement your second province and push you into the set stage to the Skaven War. The Skaven War makes it so that you are at war with every single Skaven on the map. All Lizardmen and all Skaven will be at war. So it'll naturally progress to an easier diplomatic relations with, with um, other Lizardmen. But of course, you will have the Skaven now trying to jump you at any situation, any turn. So, switch to Kalita. Take out Kalita. She'll probably have expanded over here to the Mud Isles or over here to uh, portions of Teclis's uh, regions. And then once you take care of Kalita, if Teclis is still around... Destroy Teclis. And I, I, it's so weird to say that, but by the turn you reach the rich, the third ritual, he will automatically declare war on you. There's there's no like way around it. It just automatically happens. So Teclis is a friend to start off with, and you should definitely take advantage of that by making trade agreements with him. But once you deal with Kalita, take care of him. And I think um, with that, let's jump into a more developed portion of the campaign so you can see some of these strategies coming to fruition. So here is my turn 64 10 and 1 campaign that I've been streaming on the channel lately. And you can see we've progressed, we've progressed from Zlonsek all the way up to the top of the Forbidden Jungle here. So what we've done is we've knocked out Kalita, we've completely destroyed her. Um, Order of Loremasters is still alive and they're probably going to be our next target outside of this um, um, the Jungle of Green Mist because I want to really cement the entire western coast of Lustria. Um, one of your big targets should be the northern spine of Sotek, which is right here. Because this then brings you into the rest of the, um, I should say, the interior of Lustria. I feel like I'm talking about, like, Africa and the Congo. <laughs> but really, like, the monument of Izatl is really big, as well as the cavern of Lexiguar. But these guys are my allies. I don't see a reason to attack them. They are actually are going to be insulating me from a lot of the Skaven threat. I I'm pretty lucky in this campaign that you can see here this is all lizard men, and that is pretty rare. Usually, the Vampire Coast will have pushed down over here by now and have taken out this, or the Blessed Dread will have completely shut out the Southern Sentinels. So this is a pretty fortunate campaign. It's actually made it life a lot easier on me. That might not be the case for you guys, so be mindful of this. You might have to really put in a lot of um, pressure towards these provinces so you have access into the eastern or interior of Lustria. Now, let's go through some uh, quick things. I want to talk about the skill progression of Ten and One himself, that is a, uh, and we'll get to see how mine has kind of progressed. But I think this is a big thing that people kind of get hung up on. So it's pretty subjective, and it's dependent upon what you want out of your lord. But a good rule of thumb with a hybrid lord is to focus on their casting first, since that negates you needing to invest in a caster hero and waste that slot in your army. You know, you've only got 20 slots; one of them's already taken up by the legendary lord itself. I want to take in a, take up another slot for your uh, caster lord if you don't need to. So. My recommendation here is one blue. You know, you want to take care of the Route Marcher immediately. That gets you your 10% movement range buff. Then go immediately into your spells. Then go into your unique line in one of these two. We'll talk about that in just a second. And then go into your blue line, finishing off with your red line. Now, an alternative build here is the way I've done it right now, which is in your blue, in your Route Marcher. Then your next step would be to go into uh, the red line and get skirmishers so you have a nice buff to all of your skinks and then go into your spells and then go into your unique line and then go into blue that's an alternative you can take uh, base it really on your comfort with the game if you aren't the best at battles get the red skink line at asap it's going to make things a lot easier for you your skinks going to be a lot more forgiving and they're going to be a lot more durable in combat really just kind of base it off of yourself so you do now have uh, the the um, the yeah, the blue line here, and how to go ab about it is really kind of a big way, a big uh, um, kind of point of contention here. The route marcher is going to be your first step. Ancient cunning, 
You can get that all the way to rank to level three. You'll have an ambush success chance of plus 30%. And one himself already has a very high ambush success chance, so this might be redundant, but Fervent is going to be huge for you. You're going to be dealing with so much incur or so many incursions from Chaos, from Skaven. Get Fervent. You're going to love it. You're going to need it. Um, Iron Disciplinarian is another good one if you have the room, but really you just need the four points to get over to Draftmaster. You're going to want to select Draftmaster, obviously, because you need to. And then, this is pretty cut and dry, get Lightning Strike and Geomantic Sustenance. We talked about that upkeep. This is minus 15% for the entire army, which is so, so huge. But once you get Geomantic Sustenance, you wanna finish it off with Renowned and Feared. Uh, for those guys, for those of you who don't know, this is your first campaign. The way Lightning Strike works is, if you have two enemy armies stacked up next to each other in reinforcement range, and you attack them, Lightning Strike allows it so they cannot pull reinforcements, in, reinforcements into that battle. You'll only fight one of those two armies, which is very good because you'll see late game AI will stack up armies against you, especially the ritual armies that are going to be besieging your cities. I'll take a big breath now. Now, for the unique line, um, go over here. You've got two choices, Fanatic or Promises of Reconstruction. Base this however you want 10 and 1 to play for you. Promises of Reconstruction is more of a campaign support lord. You can see here that this is wins of magic bonuses, untainted and tax rate benefits, um, casualty replenishment and upkeep reductions, and global recruitment and sacrificial offerings. So just base it how you want. I go with Fanatic because I like Disciples of Sotek. This gives you 20 armor onto your Red Crested Skinks, giving them a whopping 50 armor, 50 armor which is great for Skinks. Um, and it is, of course, a more, um, not melee-centric, but a more aggressive Lord choice. It increases his physical resistance by 10%. Backing it all the way. Oh, I thought, I thought it gets 15, but yeah, it's 10% there. Uh, Prophecy of Eradication helps out as well um, with his actual combat stats, increasing his weapon strength by 20% when you're going to be fighting anything that has to do with the rituals or with Skaven, which you'll be fighting primarily the entire campaign. So couldn't recommend it enough. And Titus Sotek gives you a nice uh, melee attack bonus for your Red Crested Skinks. Now, as far as mounts go, um, I skip the horn one. Don't think it's very useful on this character. Um, I go for the Ripper Dactyl as fast as I can, and then of course you're going to go for the Ancient Stegodon, Engine of the Gods, as fast as possible. He will retain his Frenzy ability, he'll get that reduction to, uh, he'll get the 5% uh, um, damage resistance buff, and a basic kind of passive Arcane Conduit, which will increase your Winds of Magic. Lastly, let's talk about spells here. Um, spells, Wyson's Wild Form, Wild Heart, Max Out Flock of Doom, and then put one point into uh, Pan's Impenetrable Pelt, I'd say. Block of Doom is going to be very strong for early game Skaven. It's going to just completely decimate them. Overcasting it's going to do even more damage. So you need the, that as fast as possible. Then, of course, you're going to want to get Evasion. Then just one point in each one of these to unlock Arcane Conduit. And that maxes out your spell line. Pretty cut and dry, so... Oh, that just kind of closed. <laughs> yeah, pretty cut and dry there. Now, as far as heroes go, here's our Skink Chieftain that I've uh, progressed up. You want to focus on replenished troops, get that maxed out as fast as possible. Um, you'll m only be able to max it out every six ranks or every four ranks, I believe it is. Um, you can see we're rank 13, so we've just maxed it out probably uh, last turn. Um, yeah, it's every four ranks. And I go with piercing shots and put them on a Pterodon. You can then put them on a Stegodon or an Ancient Stegodon. Um, but Piercing Shots gives him a nice 15% increase to his missile damage. If you have him on a Pterodon, he can just fly above things and just shoot them all day long. It's a huge, huge advantage. You don't have to worry about bringing him into combat until he's properly supported with 10 and one or other Pterodon Riders. So this way you just have a Lord that's pretty much not going to get threatened except for, I don't know, Skaven Slave Slingers, which are not going to do much damage to him. So that's the way I would approach your character skill progression. Um, we've already talked about research a little bit here. Um, you can see my research tree kind of going along the lines of what I said. I mean, I did, I had room to go into other things, but Skinks is done, Monuments is done, War is done. We've done the first two of spawning, and we're finishing up crafts. Once we unlock the next tier, we'll definitely get Sequence of Skink Invigoration. You want that upkeep re reduction. Another big one is a Sequence of the Beast Keepers, which is at the very end of the Tablet of Beasts. It's very annoying. So if you feel like you're gonna go with a lot of beasts, here's your uh, upkeep reduction for them. But for the most part, you just, again, wanna focus on anything that has upkeep reduction or, um, or any kind of benefits to trade or um, like, like the sequence of the sea, laborers, and um, sequence of the geographical, the geological prospecting really helps with your income if you're having those uh, issues. 
Lastly, though, not lastly, but another area is a provincial building. So let's take a look at that. So here is our Forgotten Isles, or, you know, let's just go over here at Cakes. So what I'd say the biggest thing here is you want to prioritize garrison buildings. I have not done that here, and I'm going to regret it. Because once we start our first ritual, we're going to have to deal with an incursion of a force. And we'll talk about those, those uh, ritual forces in just a little bit here. But you want to make sure you're going with as many garrison buildings as you can. Because in the late game, as you have a very large stretch of land here, it's going to be very hard to get to any one of these provinces quickly than if you were in the interior of Lustria. It's quick to move between these five, six um, settlements, but not so quick to move from here to there. So you want garrison buildings up as many places as possible because what you're going to be dealing with is, again, not just these rituals, but you have the Skaven War. We're already in the this, this second stage of the Prophecy of Sotek. The Skavens will become pouring over these mountains using the Underway. So be very mindful of that. Using those garrison buildings is going to help you as much as possible. You can see here the Dust Gate. I already have a, the upgraded garrison here, the upgraded garrison here. Let's take a look at what that gets you. I mean, that is a beefy garrison. You get a nice Scar Veteran. You get a, a Skink Priest of Beasts. You get quite a few Skink, or I'm sorry, Warriors themselves. Some Chameleon Skinks. You get access to a Pterodon Rider. And then a Bastilodon Solar Engine. And then two units of Cold One Spear Rider. So it's a very strong, nice um, garrison here that you really don't have to worry about rebellions, uh, Skaven, like the smaller Skaven armies and ritual armies until you get like something to reinforce them. So be very mindful of that. Of course, the Death Gate is buffed by this. This which gives the uh, Skink Priest of Beasts and the Bastilodon Solar Engine. Um, so be mindful of that. This is this is what your standard garrison would look like without that building. So having those garrison units is very, very crucial. Um, also, so we're talking about building up our, our buildings here. You want to focus on, like we said earlier, the Geomantic Pylon. You can see we've got the Geomantic Pylon here at the Forgotten Isles and here at Cakes, Cox, Gooks, that gives us that rank three of the geomantic web strength. Now, in addition to that, you want to blitz the star chamber. That is uh, the tier four building here, which allows you to do the Rite of Awakening. The Rite of Awakening allows you to produce a slant mage priest. Now, why that is important is that when you do the Rite of Awakening, it'll open up a quest for you that starts Lord Croak. So when you unlock the Rite of Awakening, I did, I did not do this properly in this campaign but wait to use the Rite of Awakening itself. If you wait to use it, you will then get a quest that says, hey, why don't you go ahead and use it? And when you do, you'll start the progression towards unlocking Lord Croak, and he will be such a boon to your army. He will do so, so, so much damage. I, I cannot stress him enough. Like, getting him in your army is gonna do, is gonna make a lot of fights easier for your main army, while you have other armies kind of holding the line for you. <clears throat> um, another big focus here is, of course, I don't think I've actually created one yet. I have not, but you want to get the Blood Trine of Sotek as fast as possible, as this gets you bestilled on Arcs of Sotek, as well as Revivification Crystals. So these are great, great benefits, and they just all overall help all the ranks of your units, your hero capacity, income. Really great thing to have in your arm, or um, in your buildings, or I'm sorry, in your provinces. And lastly, I'd say the the best way to generally, like when we're taking a look at minor settlements and provinces. The Golden Colossus here is a really great example of how I would approach um, making or building up a minor um, a minor settlement within a province. So you want, of course, your holy. You can't not have this building. You want a garrison building, then you want an income building, and then you want a unique building. Now, this is not always the case. You want to prioritize growth above everything else. So in this case, I was lucky that I had a growth building. And I had another growth building in this place at one point, and I, I destroyed it because I wanted something different. But my point here is you want growth, income, garrison. And if you can't make, um, a, I'm sorry, if you can make a unique building, make that instead of the income building. And then once you've maxed out your growth, like we have here, I will still need one more, one more rank. But once you max out growth, you can destroy this building and replace it with the income or the unique building that you did not create. Blonde sec here will eventually have a garrison here. And you can see that I'm not really worried about its uh, growth because the unique building gives it growth. These unique buildings are gonna be so much easier for you. You always wanna blitz the unique building over an income building. And once you've maxed out on growth, destroy the growth building and make your opposite, the income or the unique building that you did not create.
Lastly, I think, um, oh, let's go into your army construction. That'll be the, that'll be one of the last things we talk about. So army construction can really differ depending on how you want to go about this. Um, we've talked about the Saurus. I don't focus on them. I think focusing on skinks, even late game is, is hugely advantageous, but the way you really want to do this is six to eight red crested skinks. You're going to be dealing with a lot of stuff. And these guys are great with their frenzy ability. Um, they don't attack as fast as a normal skink cohort but they still do just so much damage and you can buff them so much from your own campaign abilities. Like look at this, 50 armor on these guys, 36 melee attack, I'm all about it. So six to eight units of Red Crested Skink, um, four, five units of Skink Skirmishers or the Chameleon Skinks. Um, I would get the Chameleon Skinks once you can unlock those. You want a Chieftain so you can get access to Replenishment. You want some Pterodon Riders in here. Um, I got lucky and I got access to a um, Ancient Segadon through Blessed Spawning, so you'll want that. You want your Ark of Sotek, and again, protect, 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 protect that Ark of Sotek. And then from there, you can fill it in however you really want. I think filling in, like I said, Pterodon Riders is a really good call because not a lot of stuff can threaten them, them or Ripper Dactyls. Um, I have Skink Cohorts in here because it's still pretty early game at 64 turns. Um, we can use those Skink cohort Cohorts to um, dive into a back line, kind of absorb some bullshit charges while we get the, uh, the Red Crested Skinks in a good location. But... Really, you've got like three or four, maybe even five slots that are kind of a wild card that depends upon how your level of play is and what you want to do with your army. Um, I'm meaning like a Blessed Spawnings. So they're they're very crucial. Like I'm going to probably fill that up with two Blessed Pterodon Riders so we have access to a lot of range firepower. Or I'm sorry, flying firepower with including the Skink Chief and with Tenet One. All right. Now, the actual last point I want to go into is the ritual. So as you progress here and see our rituals so we have to we have to do our very first one now i don't have a lot of really great strategies for how to take care of those rituals um because it's just pretty much weathering the storm you're just going to be dealing with unending tides so like i said make sure you've got your garrison buildings built make sure you're spreading out your army so that you can deal with where those rituals might possibly occur i believe the first one will always appear in your um your actual factions capital so over here by kex now Ritual 1, you're just going to see chaos. Ritual 2, the ritual of rumination, you're going to see chaos and the Norska on the open seas. Ritual 3, the ritual of contemplation, you're going to see Norskans, chaos, and Skaven. So it's going to get pretty dicey at Ritual 3. Keep in mind, you're also going to be at war with Skaven. So anytime you start these rituals, make sure your borders are shored up, you've got as much defense, and you're not going to be worrying about any incursions from your native enemies you've already established. Ritual 4, Ritual of Deliberation, is going to just be Chaos and Skaven, but a lot more of them. You're, going to be, you're not going to be dealing with Norskins in the open sea, which is nice, but you're just going to be dealing with way more armies than you did the last time. Now your final one, the Ritual of Alignment here, is going to be just Skaven. You're going to deal with a massive amount of Skaven initially, and then after 10 more turns, you're going to deal with a second huge, bigger wave of Skaven. So really making sure that you have a lot of armies spread out, probably three or four by the time you get to that, maybe even five or six, depending on how big your economy is and where you've actually expanded to, making sure you have garrison buildings in place. So just get walls on things. You want walls, because those walls will ensure that they have to build siege equipment and you can get to those um, cities to help relieve them as fast as possible. But that I think really kind of covers all the little nuances here. Again, we talked about the right of Sotek. You can use that to a lot of great advantage when you know you've got a ritual you're going to do. The um, attrition will help you out a ton. The right of primeval glory will help you get feral cold ones. Those are now recruitable through an actual uh, building now, so you don't have to worry about that if you want feral cold ones. The right of ferocity is good whenever you make a brand new lord, you want to build him up. This is great because they're in uh, increases the recruitment rank and your local recruitment capacity. So it's a real great way to uh, get a Lord up and standing quite quickly. But with that, I think we have a good breakdown of how to approach 10 and 1's campaign. Again, a lot of this will be variable dependent on actions you take. And please, guys, don't feel the need to stick to this method of play. This is more tips on how to have an efficient first 20 turns so you're not playing catch up throughout the mid game. One of the biggest challenges in Total War is getting a grip on the early game so that you're not being or not behind the power curve. Once you've really mastered that, the rest of the campaign is way, way more accessible. Just remember to try and be very aggressive with Skaven. Hunt them down using the Astromancy stance, which we haven't talked about, so let's take a look at that real quick. If I can select it. 
the way astromancy works here is you get a, a um, campaign movement range of course so you have to adopt it. it's 20 25 but you can't move as fast either but you can have the ability to vanguard a lot of your units um, and you can intercept things in the underway by 50 percent. so if something's bouncing back and forth over you pop an astromancy stance you'll probably ambush them and if you win you kill that army outright and you also get a nice um increase to your own defense chance for ambushes and you also increase your line of sight by 150 so you can detect ambushes a lot easier so astromancy stance is a very good way to counter that but in addition you can also ambush yourself because what we've talked about he has a very high ambush stance just off the bat like there's like 50 percent right here because in the open um planes here but i think this would be like 90 well what appear i'm full of shit oh there's 80 percent. there it is haha -ha. but your punishment really carries you in this campaign so Use it to your advantage and challenge yourself. Don't use any Saras until you absolutely have to. Red Crested Skinks really allow you to put a lot of very cheap and strong anti-armored um, infantry out there, especially with the buffs from um, um, from, from the buffs from Frenzy, not Fanatic. I was looking at the, the Frenzy itself. Gives you a lot of really good buffs here and from the actual campaign line Fanatic itself. But... Have a great time with the campaign, you know. I, I, I really enjoyed this one, guys. We'll be doing a video on Ikit in case you're struggling with it there as well. But as always, have a good one and take care.